Hi everyone. I am Saranj and today I will be take, conducting a talk on code coverage through unit tests running in subprocesses slash threads locally and automated on GitHub. So this talk will be focused on a lot of unit testing, code coverage and more unit testing which is something that we all hate but bear with me for the next I guess 30 to 35 minutes and we will get over it. So the main agenda of this talk would be to see how to run unit tests in a subprocess and how does that how running them affects the value of our code coverage and then how can we rectify that and again i'll try to keep it quick so let's get started all right so a brief about me i am an undergraduate pursuing cs and maths from university of delhi and you guys did right i'm from india i like python and julia and open source research software and i also maintain a few of them so some of them are pybam which stands for python battery mathematical modeling batbot which stands for battery bot and vector that just stands for vector which can be used to manipulate physics based vectors in python and i also contribute to a lot of them so you can find me on github and on the website and from my shirt i like a lot of superheroes so moving to the main agenda of this talk unit testing so we will slowly build up on to the problem statement that we listed in the title and then we will move towards the solution so uh, building upon means introducing unit testing and code coverage so a quick recap for people already experienced and a quick introduction for beginners so starting with unit testing so unit testing as the slide says means writing extra code to test your main code or the user facing functionality or sometimes even the developer facing functionalities and again testing if your code works but in an automated way preferably in an automated way moving on to code coverage as the slide says again it means how much of your code is covered by these unit tests so code coverage is basically a percentage value that will tell you how much of your unit tests are covered or how much of your code is covered by the unit test that you're in and again this should also be an preferably in an automated way and there are a lot of applications like cover all and code co which promote the automation part and we'll be using code co in the talk so quickly going through a small example of unit testing uh, let's say we have a feature named add which is just a simple python function that returns uh, the addition of two numbers and let's say this is written in a module or a file named calc.py so the unit test for this particular function or module would look something like this we will be using the unit test library uh, which comes loaded with python i think so uh, you can import the unit test library and then the unit test library comes loaded with a lot of assert uh, assert star methods which we can use to test or check our code so for example here i'm using assert equal method uh, to equate the values returned by the function and the values which are expected these function these methods can be accessed by inheriting the unit test dot test case class so uh, a regular unit test would look something like this a class which can be named whatever you like but it should obviously convey that you're use, uh, writing unit tests inside the class so maybe started with test and then the methods which each method is a single unit test and each of this each of these methods should start with test underscore so that unit test knows that these are the unit tests and other methods should not be run when you're running unit tests and inside these methods you can uh, check a lot of values but all of them would be considered as a single unit test the last two lines just tells unit test to run these unit tests when we're running the module itself so uh, that is a pretty common or a standard way of unit uh, running unit tests in python then moving on to the next part the command python hyphen m unit test starts all the unit tests and the hyphen v so it would start all the unit tests in your current directory it would automatically or recursively find these tests so the files should also start with test underscore I think or just test and the functions or the method should start with test. After it finds all the tests it would obviously run them and then show you a pretty output. The hyphen v would show you a pretty output. If you don't add this particular hyphen v then it would just show a dot and that would be it. So with hyphen v it would tell you which test it is running and then a simple okay if it passes. So we ran one test and it went pretty well. We can do the same thing with coverage. So coverage dot py is another python library uh, you can install it via pip so pip install coverage and then you can run the same unit test using coverage run hyphen in unit test and then the hyphen v again stands for a predefined output uh, additionally running a uh, test with coverage would also generate a dot coverage file this is the file that would contain the coverage value or the percentage of unit tests covered by a percentage of the code covered by unit tests and uh, obviously this file would not be human readable but we can use uh, coverage commands to read this file in a variety of ways so for example i can simply print i can simply type in coverage report and that would print the coverage report inside my terminal 
and let's say we don't want the coverage report for files starting with test underscore because we know that these files contain unit tests and we don't actually want to measure the coverage value of the unit test because that is not something that is user facing. So we can omit these files using the hyphen hyphen omit feature of coverage and there are a lot of such flags and features which are available in coverage documentation. Another such useful command is coverage HTML. It generates uh, almost a website for your um, whole Python code that tells you where the coverage is going down and where the coverage is uh, complete. So that is a command that can be used uh, for more visualization, but we will be using port overhead, so uh, we won't be needing that command. All right, so moving ahead, why would I do unit testing and code coverage? So like, why should I increase my already huge open source workload to include uh, unit testing and coverage reports and all the mess that it brings with it? Uh, there are a lot of reasons for it. Some of them are listed on the screen. So it makes a code base reliable and obviously it improves its quality. So you will discover bug while writing unit tests or you will see that a particular part of your code is very slow as the unit tests are taking a lot of time. So you might improve its quality just because you're writing unit tests. It then makes your code maintainable. So it makes it easier to accept code contributions from other people. So you don't have to worry about if someone's contribution is going to break your whole already existing code base. Uh, unit testing and coverage will ensure that it doesn't. Uh, coverage will ensure that the person is adding unit tests as they're adding the new feature. Then it lets you check uh, what existing code a new feature would break. Again, something similar to maintainability. So if you add a new feature to your code base, you must know if it is breaking the already existing features and unit testing is a perfect way to do that. It keeps your production alive. So it keeps your production master main branch safe because you won't be pushing any code on these branches unless they pass all the unit tests and the coverage value don't, doesn't go down. Then coming to coverage, coverage obviously pushes you to add more unit tests and uh, again, it makes your code more maintainable. Unit tests also help you identify bugs, but not always though. Some bugs can skip, uh, get through unit tests, but some of them are caught by unit testing your code base. So don't be this person, a person who doesn't write any unit tests and who do anything to skip through unit tests or don't be, and don't be this person who writes the first line of their project and unit test it, or starts writing unit tests even before beginning their project. Instead, maintain a balance. So your first, you should roughly follow this pyramid or loosely follow this pyramid, and you should most probably go from the bottom to the top. The first priority should be writing the basic features of your project so, so that your project is usable. So it gains some kind of users and it isn't just an isolated project which is incomplete then you should move ahead and add and improve unit tests of that project inside that project so that your projects become reliable and more people cannot trust it. The next step should be automating these tests and turning on coverage. So you know which tests will be failing. So you know which tests will, uh, you know which tests are missing. Uh, by, you will know that by the coverage value of your code base and everything will be automated so you won't have to worry about running everything manually. Then making unit tests mandatory so you don't have to worry about a random person accidentally breaking your project. So let's say if a random person contributes to your project, you must ensure that their code is not breaking the already existing code base and unit tests will ensure that that doesn't happen. All right, let's move ahead and set up a dummy project for a top lid. I already have that set up. We have a very simple calculator file. Let me add the slides. Yes, we have a very simple calculator file. So just four functions, add, subtract, divide, and multiply the divide function additionally raises a value error and the other functions are pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, they just return the specified operation. We can then move ahead to write unit tests for this uh, module of file. So we'll import the unit test library, we'll import all these functions and just as we wrote the unit test for addition, we'll write unit test for subtraction, multiplication, division and division would also check the if the method or if the function is raising a value error at some particular input. So for example, sending b equal to zero would obviously uh, raise a value error because uh, we've added that here. But let's say in the future, if someone removes this statement, then these but this particular unit test will fail because it won't raise a value. And you can check a lot of such methods in unit test documentation. So the documentation is very well written and there is a complete list of such assert methods. All right, so our dummy project is set up. Let's move ahead and run tests and coverage for this dummy project. So let's make sure we are in the dummy project directory. All right, so uh, we can do python hyphen m unit test and then hyphen v, which would run all the four unit tests. 
uh, print up the simple look if they pass and everything work. If I don't add hyphen V just to show you, it would print only the four dots, which is not very uh, informative. So I prefer adding hyphen V everywhere. Our next step would be running coverage, but uh, let's say we don't want to add that hyphen hyphen omit option every time we write our coverage command. So coverage comes up with a, a configuration file. We can set up a configuration file for coverage, which would also be useful in the next parts next parts of this talk. So let us set up a dot coverage RC file, which would tell coverage what we want and what we don't want. So there again. The file is very well documented documented in coverage documentation so you can go ahead and read that but uh, just a brief overview it the file is written in the typical toml or the any format and with a lot of section headings and then uh, the section headings contain values so for example here i'm specifying that i want to omit everything that is in the current directory and start with test underscore and has a dot by extension so if now i run coverage uh, if I run unit test with coverage uh, library and hyphen V again for the predefined output, so everything works, everything is okay. In the directory where we were running this, we can see a dot coverage file which was generated by coverage and we cannot read it, um, at least not in uh, VS Code. We can then move ahead to uh, calculate or display the file in our terminal itself so coverage report will do that for us it was a 100% coverage that means our unit tests are covering exactly 100% of our module which is supposed to be user facing so uh, if anything here goes wrong the unit test will fail and that would tell us that something is not right with the new code edition and we should avoid it right. so our dummy project is set up I guess let's yeah so everything works coverage report works and the dummy project is set up. Let's move ahead and create a remote repository. So this would be done, this would basically be done to automate everything. And GitHub provides a lot of such features like GitHub Actions and CodeCo -code integration. So we'll quickly create a GitHub repository. I already have the screen open here. Let's name it Python API 22. And description. All right, so this CodeCo option might not show up for you, but you should sign up for CodeCo right now or uh, if you're watching this talk afterwards, uh, but you can skip it right now. So not necessarily turning on right now, but when we'll get to the code curve part, then uh, you would benefit if you turn it on. It let us initiate a Git repository here quick, and then let's push everything. So let's say git add. Uh, initial commit. And then let's push it Till then, let's log in into code course. I think you'll need to sign up if you don't already have an account. And all of your repositories show up here, which are configured with code code. So you don't have to create a new repository coming into code code. But once you upload the coverage report to code code using GitHub, it automatically creates a repository for you. So no extra configurations from code code side. All right, our project has been pushed. Let's refresh it once. All right, so everything is working. Next, let's move to YAML and code code. So this would be the part which would automate everything. Let's set up GitHub Actions, which can be accessed through the Actions tab. Now, GitHub presents us with a lot of basic templates. We don't want a Python package, but we do want a Python application because we will be testing everything. Let's configure this. All right, so this basically tells GitHub Actions how you want the CI or the continuous integration test to run, how you want it to run. So let's rename it to Python API. And on every push to this repository, let's move the branches. So on every push and request to this repository, no matter what branches, this testing suite will run um, using GitHub Actions. Let's get rid of the permission and job. Let's say we want to add two jobs. One would be style and one would be build. So the style part would check if our code base is well linted and then the build part would go ahead and uh, basically run the test. So I already have the style part written somewhere over here. Yes. Let me copy paste this. And paste it. So 
So now the first job is style. It would run on Ubuntu and it would set up Python 3.9. Then it would install Flake it, which can be used to check if your code is linted well. It's just a Python library and you can try it out. The command it would run would be it would first upgrade pip, then it would install Flake it, and then it would check style with Flake it, which can be done by just writing out Flake it. And after that, it would run style. Uh, after that, it would run the build job and the build job would be requiring the style job. So if the style job fails, the it won't proceed ahead to build. So your code art has to be well linted if it uh, want if you want it to proceed ahead with the unit test. So for the build job, let's say we will set up Python 3.9 and set up Python v4 is out. So we should be using that 3.9 just to be safe. And we don't have a requirements file. We don't want flake it because we're uh, a good practice always to use Python hyphen M before pip. We don't want to install flake it because we're doing that in the job above this. We don't want PyTest either. We're using unit test, which comes loaded with Python, but we will be requiring coverage. And we're already checking the our codes linting with flake it. And we want to run unit test, not with PyTest, just unit test run. Uh, let's say unit test with run unit test and calculate coverage. Or we don't even need the unit test library. We will be doing everything with coverage. So coverage run hyphen m unit test hyphen we would generate the coverage report for us. The next step would be to upload this coverage report to code off and let's see how we can do that. So let's say upload coverage report. And there are already a lot of pre-built actions. So the actions built or written by someone else, which you can directly use inside your workflow. So code Cove already maintains a maintains an action which can be used to push or upload these coverage reports to your code core code code profile. So let's copy paste that. And indentation. Alright, we don't we can't specify run and uses both, so we don't want to run anything. And just to be safe here, we'll be using the V2. Alright, I think everything looks good, but just to ensure that I didn't make any typos, I will copy paste the already written one because I know that work. And yes, everything is same. I think just the comment will remove. Alright, this looks good. Let's commit this uh, directly to the main branch. And alright, we didn't rename it to something more informative. Python app.ml works right now. Moving to the actions tab, this yes, this already triggered an action. That means everything is right now running. Whatever we wrote is running right now. So it would first check the style of the code base. If that passes, it would go to the build. If that fails, it would automatically cancel the build part. Uh, the style part passed, going to the build part. Like this would take some time, I guess. Our next step would be to create a PR with readme and add badges. So just to check if everything is working fine, we'll create a PR with readme. So for badges, code cove. All right, so we would require uploading them. Let's check here. The unit test went well, just as they were going locally. And the uploading part went well too. We have a success status and there is a result URL. But I think if I refresh code cove, it would automatically show me a repository here. All right, so code cove took some time, but now that URL works, we can go to the repository normally through profile and it should work too. It shows no data available, probably because it's still trying to sync, but we do have the coverage report inside. So it shows us 100% coverage as it was showing us locally. And here we can visualize the coverage too. So it shows all of these lines, the ones marked in green are covered by the unit test. Everything works as expected and uh, the coverage is 100%. Let's go ahead and create a readme file with the badges. So let me go ahead and yep. Uh, GitHub actions come with badges too, which are very useful when a developer is using uh, reading them. So let's add the badge here and these badges are dynamic. So if your CI is failing, it would automatically convert this badge to failing and a developer or a user can infer from your readme itself that something is wrong with the repository. Next, let's go to a code curve. Let's close that tab. The settings part should have a badge. Let's copy that and paste it here. This should show 100%. Yes, if the coverage goes down again, this badge would automatically update and would show 
or the new coverage value. Let's create a new branch and keep the same name and create a pull request. So ideally, all of these checks should run here and the code code check should also run and it should point out that the coverage is okay. So we are not making any mistakes and all the tests should pass. Till the time the test run, let's move ahead and follow alert everything would work and it should work. Okay, so the next step would be running these tests inside the thread. Let's wait for this pull request. Yes, so the pull request is ready. All the checks have passed and the code code bot should be commenting here any second. All right, so the code curve comment is here. Code curve bot automatically comments on your pull request. So it shows that the main branch has coverage 100% and uh, this new pull request has a coverage 100%. Nothing has changed, same line, same files, except adding the readme file, which doesn't actually count as a code file. So it won't be affecting the tests. And code curve also have these two new uh, checks, which pass in the, at that pull request. So you're now sure that you can merge this pull request because all the tests are passing and the coverage value didn't go down. So that means a new code wasn't added or if a new code was if some new code was added the tests were added with along with that code let's merge this pull request and let's move ahead uh, going to the main branch it should show yes the 100 percent code curve or the coveted value and everything passing moving ahead to threads i already have that set up here let's move these files out all right let me quickly get pull everything so that we don't get any conflict afterwards. Moving the calc files out and moving or the normal files out and moving the thread files in. Let me close all the other files. Alright. So the only difference in the main code here would be that we won't be returning the statement direct uh, the values directly rather we will be adding them to a dictionary because we cannot return uh, value that simply from a thread. So let's say if you want to make these functions user facing, then you don't want to add a return dictionary just as the first argument. Rather, you will add it at the last and make it uh, a default none. So if the user specifies that argument, that means that they are running it through a thread and they want the value to be added to a dictionary rather than being return directly but if they're not specifying this dictionary then that means they're just running the function normal so let's say uh, specify right when running in a thread or unit testing all right that looks good but that might go above the flaked limit i'll keep it short uh, let's see yeah, 47 column, column with 47. Okay. Um, some typos here. Right, so our testing part would be doing the exact same thing that it would, in, uh, additionally, it would be running these tests inside a thread so that uh, we can check if our coverage value goes down or goes up or whatever happens with that. It would spawn a thread, start a thread, and then take out the return value from the dictionary, which we are adding here. Uh, which should also be done ideally with these functions as well so you can go ahead and do that right now then it just assert equals that value with the expected value everything looks fine and again it all it all depends on you how you want to run these tests in a thread if you want to run each of these tests in a thread or if you want to run a particular method in a thread or if you want to run the entire test suite in a thread or divide the entire test suite in various threads it's all up to you but it should behave exactly like it is going to right now and yes, our tests, thread part is set up. Let's run the tests here, which would be using coverage on hyphen M unit test. So I'm going here, navigating to that command. Here we are. And then printing the coverage report. Uh, report. And everything works well. So as it was working before, it works right now. So no issues right now. Let's quickly check out to a branch and let's hit thread and push it up, get add, commit to the message, let's hit threads again and push, which would require us to set an upstream. So I can configure it with the new version of Git and I think I'll do this after this talk. So let's push and we'll have a branch ready here. Here we are. Let's create the pull request just to 
make sure that we're doing everything right the tests are not failing and the coverage value is not going down all right the changes look good the style tests are passing so the build test would run automatically and in the time this test runs let's move on to the next slide so why threads and some additional information Threads allow you to execute tests parallelly, saving CI time and resources. So, for example, if your project is very huge and the CI time is very large, you might want to use threads because then if your CI time exceeds a particular limit, GitHub Actions as well as other uh, uh, platforms which offer to run CI for you would start costing some money. And obviously that means resources and more time. Going through the examples of repositories using threads, you can uh, search this particular query in github and that will show you a lot of repositories which are using threads to run unit tests uh, some additional information some things that you need to make uh, ensure that you're not doing while using threads is you should use uh, which you should ensure you're doing while using threads is that ensure multiple threads don't ac access a single variable at a given time which uh, is something like the producer consumer problem with the shared buffer or shared memory so ensure that that doesn't happen because that might lead to a multiple situation that you don't want to get in maybe deadlocks then you should be using threads with uh, thread safe uh, data structures. So most of the Python built-ins are thread safe. So here I'm using dictionaries, but you could have using, used other Python built-in data structure. And that would have done exactly the same thing. Let's move on to uh, pull request. It did work. So all of the tests are passing and now let's wait for the code performance. It should have appeared in the pull request here. All right, our code cove thing is in. And usually it doesn't take this much time for code cove. Maybe code cove is down right now or something, but usually it is very quick. So we see that two new lines are added and both of them are covered. So these two lines should be uh, the lines in our function. These two lines most probably because these lines were not present before and the coverage is still 100%. If we move on to the code cove part, going to threads. Yes, it shows all of these lines are covered and these lines are added new. So. Uh, short and sweet information and all of the checks pass. We can move ahead and merge this pull request without like doubting if it would break our already existing code base. Going ahead and it does work. Everything is 100%, everything is passing. So the threads part work. Everything works. Now let's move on to sub processes and see if they would affect our coverage value. Again, let me pull everything to make sure we don't get any merge conflicts. All right, I think everything is in. Oh, I think I did not get out in. And let me pull everything in. Great. Uh, all right, let's add the process functions in here, which would where we would be running everything inside a sub process. Uh, basically the tests. Let's close the files and open up these two files. All right. So this would look something very similar to thread. So here, instead of using a dictionary, I'm using a queue because it makes more sense to use a queue because we are returning only a single value. And uh, you can still use a dictionary, but uh, appropriate data structures for the appropriate work. We do a similar thing. We put the value inside the queue. And if the user is not unit testing or if the user does not want to run the function inside a sub process, we just return the value. Uh, ideally, this should also be populated with these functions, but I leave that up to you. Going into the test part, we again have the similar kind of imports and going into the methods, we would first be acquiring a queue, an empty queue from the multiple, uh, we would be using the multiprocessing library for uh, spawning sub processes and dealing with multiprocesses. And the library comes loaded with the data structures as well, which are multiprocessing safe or uh, sub processes safe. So we would be using queue then we would be firing up a, a process through multiprocessing and we would be targeting the function which we are testing passing the arguments and starting the multiprocess getting the particular value then when the multiprocess is finished it would be joined with the uh, the parent process and then we would assert equal that the value that we got from q and the value that we were expecting are same or not everything looks similar and it should all work the test should pass and everything should work uh, similar for the rest of the functions as well let's go ahead and run the test all right so clicking on the slide pull and then yes the test let copy paste this or i think we would have this here yeah all the tests pass as we were looking into and let's now run coverage report because we would have a dot coverage right here all right a typo 
coverage report and surprisingly it doesn't work so the coverage went down by 50 percent whereas we are testing everything inside iconic test similar to threads and similar to not using threads or sub processes but sub processes weirdly behaves differently from threads and the normal call all right let's push this to a remote repository to make sure that code points this out and a ci fails which ideally should uh, let's add every file and commit with some message all right uh, let's switch to a branch first make a pull request let's say process and then commit with the message process and push setting up upstream again all right that is done pull request again and create pull request let me just cross check if all the files are changed well yes so we've deleted the thread files which are present right now in the main branch and we've added these process files again the test will run the code of test will run and it will tell us if something is breaking so let's wait for that so everything passed all the tests except the code of test so code of tells us that the main branch had 100% coverage and this particular pull request has a 50% coverage so the coverage is going down to 50% which we saw exactly happen locally uh, then the hits and the misses, so six lines are hit, six lines are missed. Uh, no, I think six lines were missed and the hits went down by six, so six lines. And both of these tests also failed. So coverage also should have put some annotations in. Yes, coverage puts annotation in your pull request. So telling you here itself that these particular lines are not covered and you should beware before, before you mold this pull request in. So let's say if someone is adding a new feature named add inside your code code inside your code base but they're not testing it code code will automatically point it out that these particular lines are not tested and code code is right now doing it with every particular line which should have not been the case because all the tests are passing and we are running everything inside the test so what is the issue here first let's look into why sub processes and some additional information hmm so sub processes again allow you to execute tests parallelly saving ci time and resources very similar to threads but again there should be a specific reason when you should use a sub process and not a thread because sub processes are obviously memory heavy and would take a lot of time because spawning a sub process is much more time taking than spawning a thread you can use sub process when you want to stop the test midway if they're taking too long and restart them so if you have probabilistic tests then sub processes are the perfect thing that you should be opting for so if the tests are taking too long or if they are stuck somewhere, you can easily restart them after a particular time limit. So some examples for this would be uh, PyBAM, BadBot, GNII, etc. You can again put this particular query inside GitHub and it would show all of the code bases using multiprocessing. So you can also spawn sub processes with other libraries, but we are specifically uh, focusing on multiprocessing here. And uh, additionally, PyBAM, PyBAM and BadBot were the repositories that uh, inspired this stuff because they use sub processes heavily, heavily and uh, the coverage value was going down when we first started using it but then we built up or we did coverage documentation and came up with a solution and then you should use multiprocess saved data structures like we're using queue out of the multiprocessing library uh, the library also comes with other more data structures like uh, the dictionary itself to return values just to make sure that the value is not lost in between uh, the return time so if it is lost then your test would fail and you would know that it's being lost so it doesn't work the sub process part doesn't work but we want it to work first let's look at why was it giving wrong results this is how coverage advice documentation puts this up measuring coverage in the, those sub processes can be tricky because you have to modify the co code spawning the process to invoke coverage .py. So coverage.py is not automatically invoked if you're running some code inside a subprocess, or especially if you're testing some code inside a subprocess. But you have to manually tell coverage.py that you will be running some code inside subprocesses, and uh, that would invoke coverage.py before uh, everything goes haywire. So let's move on to a fix. First, let's. All right, you should not ideally be doing this, but for the sake of this talk, let's merge this pull request. If your coverage value is going down, you should not ideally merge a pull request unless there are some very special cases. So the coverage value went down by 50% as we were expecting um, because it went down locally too. So it should go down on the remote repository too. Now let's move on to fix this problem. 
So the first fix would be changing our configuration file. So this was one of the reason that we added configuration file uh, before in our tutorial or in the talk. So let's go ahead and but first of all, let's go to the main branch and let's pull avoid any merge conflicts. We don't want to solve the merge conflicts while sitting in a talk. So let's check out a new branch called fix and go to our config file, the dot coverage RC file, and add these two particular lines. All right. So line here parallel equals to true appends the machine name process id and some random number to the data file name so uh, when we run the test you'll notice that now we won't be generating a single dot coverage file rather we'll be generating a lot of dot coverage files so each one of them would be uh, mapping to the coverage of a single sub process and just to name them very well we will be using parallel equals to true uh, you will see when this happens right now and this part here, concurrency equal to multiprocessing, is the part that tells coverage.py that we will be running unit tests inside the subprocess. You can replace this particular field, the multiprocessing field, with the library that you're using to spawn multi uh, subprocesses. So, for example, gavint or greenlet or eventlet. You can replace multiprocessing here. And then a regular omit part, which would omit the coverage for the files we don't need. Let's go ahead and run this command to make sure that everything is working or to take if everything is working now. Right, let me keep this open so that you can see the coverage files. Once I run the test, everything passes and see. There was not a single dot coverage file which was generated, but a lot of coverage files. So let me delete this part. Delete this coverage file. And now if I run this command, it should automatically overwrite these files. Okay, it didn't. It should have but yes, it was appending random numbers using the parallel equal to true option. So maybe that is why. Let me run the command again. And it would not generate a dot coverage file, rather, it would generate a lot of dot coverage and then appending the laptop name and then the process ID and some random numbers to it. So we can differentiate the different coverage files. Now, each of these coverage files should be ideally mapped to a particular sub process and it should only carry coverage for that particular sub process. To combine all of these files together, we can use another command provided by coverage, which is coverage combine. It would combine all these coverage files into a dot coverage file and then we can run coverage report to see a hundred percent report again so this configuration fix works pretty well all right now let's push this up to our remote repository to make sure everything works there but before that we'll need to edit our ci so this particular command and then running coverage combined to combine all the uh, different coverage files that is generated by coverage.py i think everything looks good now we can add this and we can push it. Let's say uh, we name it fix. Oh, we put the remit like a typo there, but let's ignore it and it push. And the test starts running again. They should all pass ideally, and then the code code test should also pass because it would bump up average 100%. Let's wait for that. The code code report is in. All the checks are passing, so no issues with code code. And code code shows that the coverage is going up by 50% because our main branch is at 50% right now. If we go to code code, it would show that these lines were not covered before and this pull request is covering these lines too. So, a uh, great visualizer code code there. We can now merge this pull request without any doubt. So, because everything is working, I could have renamed that here, but uh, let's again ignore it for now. All right, so everything is working. The configuration fix is working. Now, there is another fix, which is a CLI fix, which is only applicable if you're using the multiprocessing library to on sub processes. So instead of passing the concurrency option in the config file here, dot, the dot coverage RC file, we can pass it directly into the CLI and everything should work. Uh, let's remove this from here. So we'll still be needing parallel is equal to true because that would be naming the file in the convention or I think we can even remove that. But the, the hyphen hyphen coverage part would do everything. And it works. And it works. It still gets all these files with the different names without even using parallel is equal to true. And if I do coverage combine and coverage report, everything works as it should have. So that was the CLI fix, and we saw the config fix. We can also push this up, but this will give us the same result. So this would ideally not change the coverage in the remote repository, but I leave that up to you. It should it shouldn't be that tough. It would be very easy because 
Quote, 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 give us all the comments and everything will work. Everything works again. So now we can run unit tests inside a thread, inside the process, and everything will work. No issue. So, uh, summarizing this talk and things to take away, we went through basics of unit testing and coverage. We then went to setting up a CI pipeline using GitHub Action and Portal, so automating everything. And then we ran tests in threads, everything worked, ran tests in sub processes, everything started failing all of a sudden. and we couldn't really pinpoint why it was failing, but coverage so coverage.ps documentation was very helpful. The drop we saw the drop in coverage while running tests in a sub process, and then we went through the title of this talk that is code coverage through unit test running in sub processes slash threads locally and automated on GitHub. So we saw a fix. We actually saw two fixes, and in the end, everything worked. And you don't have to care about how you're running unit tests. Your coverage will always be correct. All right. Thank you. So these are my contact links if you want to get in touch and I think I'll be taking up questions now which would be like thanks again.